All right, so we're going to look at uh, color and color relationships. You guys can read the whole article through, but I just wanted to briefly explain the information on here and then look at the assignment that I'm giving you as well as I've downloaded it so that I can show you how to set up your file in particular because that's going to be something that you're all going to need to know. Um, so as far as color goes, there are these three attributes that we generally talk about when we talk about color. Hue is the place on the rainbow. Saturation is how much versus how little color. This bar is actually misleading. It should turn gray, not black, right? So no saturation is gray, anywhere in gray. Full saturation is completely bright, whatever color that might be. And then lightness or light and dark would be how close to black and how close to white we're getting, okay? With those three things combined, we can basically pick any color. And if I open up in Photoshop and just grab my color picker, this is basically HSB mode right now. You can see on the right hand side, we've got all these different dots that we could be clicking. I think by default, it might be set to RGB, something like this or this or this, which I hate. It could also be set to this one, which a lot of people use and there's nothing wrong with that. The saturation one I just think is a little bit weird. I tend to stick with the hue because it puts the rainbow off to the side and then the field becomes a brightness and saturation field, okay? So if I want to pick a particular color, we go sliding through the hue somewhere. Let's just land on blue-ish somewhere here. And then if I click and drag down, I'm making this darker. Up is brighter. But left and right, left is desaturated. So all of these are gray tone scales. And over here, these are all the most saturated version of the color. But you can see as I get darker, it doesn't seem to matter as much anymore. Okay. Generally, when you're picking your colors, if you're using the same kind of um, system as I, then you're going to want to try to stay away from this upper right hand corner unless you really, really want something to jump out in the scene. Okay, This is the full saturation, full brightness color, and if you only pick colors up in that corner, your colors are going to stab into people's eyes. They're going to be very, very high contrast, violent colors, Okay, almost like vibrating. Uh, it's also kind of misleading if you were going to print out your document. Colors of that brightness don't always appear in printed documents. In fact, we've got some warnings that pop up here in mine. This one, let's see what it says, out of gamut for printing. So it's like, I can't print that. Then this one, not web safe, as in if you tried to put this on a website, we would never see that color. So if I start sliding it down somewhere else, so the web safe one you can ignore most of the time. If you want to, you can click on it and it'll adjust it over to a web safe color. But the out of gamut one is a pretty good warning to say, if you wanted to print this on a piece of paper, it's not going to look like how you expect. Okay. So in general, stay out of this corner unless you are just going for a really bright highlight. Uh, if you want to pick colors that are more reasonable, generally you're going to pick them in an arc going from the darkest, most saturated corner up towards that corner where you should stay out of but not quite reaching it and then arcing over towards the least saturated brightest color. That's because optically in general as something gets brighter it also gets desaturated and as something gets darker generally you can add more saturation or you have to add more saturation to it to have any effect on it. Right. So as I slide this back here it looks very very gray very soon um, when I move away from that right hand wall. Um, whereas up here, uh, if I start moving down, this starts to look pretty gray as soon as I start moving straight down from here. So if we want that full spectrum of interesting colors, generally follow an arc like this. You can stay on this diagonal if you want to, but if you really have to, you can come down into this corner. There's no problem with that. Just we're not going to see the difference generally down here, uh, and we're not going to see the difference mm, somewhere within this range, right? It's going to be really hard to see any saturation entering in until we get about up to here. Then we start to see the difference. Okay. So that's just a basic scheme for thinking about and selecting colors. Uh, and those are the, the verbiage for that. Sometimes people use chroma for saturation instead. Um, sometimes you'll see value or brightness or lightness, darkness, whatever. That's all the same thing. But those three components make up a color. Then we've got our basic grade school color 
relationships. Okay, these are primary colors: blue, red, yellow. Because if you take two of them and you combine them, you end up getting the secondary colors. That would be for pigment, and because our digital um, drawing tools are simulating pigment, it tends to be true here as well. So if I get a red, blue, and a let's get it right about there, blue and yellow, I should be able to select and mix these. Yeah, just checking that my brush is semi-transparent. So I put some yellow over here and then grab some red and not push as hard as I can. It's going to start to mix orange eventually. Might have to do it a few times back and forth. But hopefully you guys can see that turning orange there. Now, why would you do that, what I just did? Why would you mix color? when you can just slide over and pick color. Why do you think you might do that? Looks more natural. Doesn't it? And it, doesn't it look kind of interesting? That color that I mixed, it's unexpected. There's things that happen when you mix color that you wouldn't have happen just by sliding through the color picker. This is a pure orange up here, right? Just right in the middle, right between yellow and orange, perfect. That's fine. But this is kind of a swirly reddish orange with little bits of yellow kind of showing through. It's got a texture to it. And the color, if I color pick this, right, is unexpectedly rosy and dark too. So you might want to mix your colors more as you're learning to do concept art because when you start painting complex things, it's going to happen a lot. I'll even do that. Like, so I just color pick this red, then open the color picker. So I'm starting from that red and now I'm going to slide it up to brighter and less saturated just to adjust and add something else to this. Then I might color pick somewhere in the transition and paint over top of it to adjust this color in a direction. So now I'm getting a, a redder, slightly darker kind of orange there. Um, so don't turn up your nose at optically mixing these things. You can get some much nicer, more satisfying results from it. But when in doubt, just use the color picker to grab your starting color. It's usually not a bad thing to do that. Okay. So for now, I'll just paint right over this with the full saturation orange and we'll pick the rest. Okay. So red plus blue, right? In between, we're going to have violet or purple. You can see how bright and crazy this purple is. Right? Never going to mix that purple, probably, between yellow and blue. We've got a fairly wide area of greens and cyans, but somewhere in here, usually a little bit closer to the yellow, we're going to have a green. Okay, So these are all the secondary colors, and then if we mix them again, we'd end up getting the tertiary colors, and at that point, all bets are off. We're going to get some very, very specific colors. Okay, The reason I bring this up is because to talk about colors, it's tough to use like Crayola names, okay? To say like something is a burnt sienna or something is like a brick red or a fire truck red or something. Oftentimes we don't know what you're talking about. Everyone knows what the secondary colors are in general, but people think about what green is differently. If you look over at the tertiary side, you might have thought this one is what green is, right? As opposed to this one that they picked here. The difference between them is that this is a blue green, okay, and this is a yellow green. Okay, how much? Very, very yellow green or very, very slightly yellow green? You can just use modifiers at that point. Okay, a reddish orange, a yellowish orange, or an orangish yellow, a reddish purple or reddish violet, right? A violet blue. That ends up making it much easier to deal with. Okay, yeah, someone put macaroni and cheese, <laughs> which it doesn't even look like what I think of macaroni and cheese, right? I think of macaroni and cheese being much more yellow, but let's not treat colors that way, okay? Treat them as a combination of primaries and secondaries with more or less hue, more or less saturation, more or less brightness, and then we're all kind of on the same page. These are your primary color relationships. This is what we're going to be playing with when we explore these tools that are linked in the bottom of this article. So if you want to play with them, 
down here. Um, these two are ones that I will commonly use if I want to mess around. And a short description of all of them down here. So basically, monochromatic is pick a point on the color wheel, don't move. You can change the other two attributes, but you shouldn't change that one. If you change that one, now you're talking about analogous. So colors that are neighbors on the color wheel. And of course, you can still change saturation and brightness. Complementary colors that are directly across from each other. Okay, more on that in a bit, but they tend to be the most intense. These tend to be the least intense. Okay? Split complementary for when complementary is just too simplistic. Start with one, go to the opposite side, step to the neighbors, you know, both directions. So we've got blue, orange, and blue, red, as opposed to the one that would be directly across, which, why is it blue? Hmm. Okay, well, anyway, triadic. We've got three equidistant points on the color wheel. They don't actually have to be equidistant, but look at split comp complementary. If you start fudging them, then you start accidentally creating a split complementary. Okay, and there's a lot of wiggle room between these two. Just think of them as either equidistant or being across from each other somewhat. And then tetradic is another one where it's like two split complementaries. At that point, it's getting so complicated, it's a little hard to keep track. So if you were going to do something like this, I'd say keep it targeted. Okay. Here are some variations of just a complementary color relationship. What I think when I look at this is that the first one is horrifying, and I hate it. Okay, I don't like looking at complementary colors because they're very, very bright, very intense. And if you were designing something like that, I hope it's a cereal box mascot or something for children because it's the only time something like that's really appropriate. Um, most people, when they say you know green and red, they say Christmas. But come on, that's not Christmas. This is going way beyond that. This is far too intense for that. Um, so beware of this, unless you really just want to make an impact. If I just lower the green saturation a bit here, it's already a bit more palatable to look at this, even though I did nothing to the red. And if you use different brightnesses and saturations, we start to get a nicer, more complex look, even though we haven't moved in terms of hue. Okay. Over on the other side, this is what you get if you have multiple variations, so as in two monochromatic colors which are complementary to each other it ends up being more satisfying and there's nothing wrong with that in fact in a full painting you basically have to do this to have any shading whatsoever uh, if i end up giving very very high contrast with differences in all three categories so this one's bright this one's dark this one's saturated this one's not and they're directly across we end up getting such a high contrast that it almost turns into black and white and at that point, I feel like it's less, mm, less intense for some reason, even though high contrast would be like readable type on a page. It's not like assaulting my eyes to have these two vibrating colors next to each other. Um, the last thing you can do is, even though we're setting up these color schemes to just be strips on a screen, in your actual implementation, you can have a very red large thing with just a little bit of green. And this would be sort of like an apple, right? An apple might have a leaf or a stem or a little worm or something, but it doesn't mean that both of those things are the same size and that can change your um, perception of the color quite a bit. Okay. Any questions about any of that just yet? Basic color harmonies, colors, how to think about them. Good. Okay. And then I've got this example here that I threw together just to show what can happen when you have a more complex relationship with color. Um, every cartoon and game that has characters and backgrounds, they're going to have some relation to each other. And you want to try to either draw objects together into a sort of, um, a sort of mental category, as in these things go together, or you want to try to separate them to kind of say they're on different teams or they're opposed to each other. So in this, I've got the green and yellow is the same for all four of these, but this highlight color is different. The reason for that is done in just about every you know four player melee game or something you can tell the difference clearly but they all look like they fit together and then over on the other side we've got this which has a very different scheme but the primary color on the left is green 
the primary color on the right is purple, so they're actually complementary to each other. So the two groups are complementary, even though this one, uh, what is that? Green, yellow, and one wild card. That's sort of like a, um, which one? That's sort of like a split complementary, sort of. And it's sort of like a tetradic, but mm, doesn't really fit into any of those. So they're all kind of slightly different. Like this one's kind of analogous. This one's kind of complementary. And then these two are like split complementary. Anyway, this one is monochromatic. Okay, all of those are purple. This is a very, very desaturated purple, slightly desaturated purple, so dark that it's black we can't even tell anymore, and then, you know, full saturation purple. Okay, you guys know where I got these colors, right? Television show, cartoon, four protagonists, yep, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, right out of an existing cartoon, easy to understand color relationships. And if you look at any well-designed cartoon that you like, there's probably something going on with the color relationships with those primary characters that you can learn something from. So I would encourage you to look at things that you like and see, well, why, why do I think this looks nice? There's probably something going on with the color relationships. Okay. All right, so videos down there for when you want to watch them. And here are the two tools we're going to look at. These are good because they let you explore color and also show you the relationship visibly so you can kind of get the idea. Let's do analogous first because it is a good example. If I click and drag the center circle, that's acting as the first input color. If I go out, they all go out. If I go in, they all come in. And so they're kind of changing saturation and brightness at the same time here, but we could adjust them down here. And in fact, why don't I switch this from RGB to HSB? Okay, so now I've got a little bit finer grain control. But all of these are analogous. If I click the outside circles and squeeze them in, you can see that this is a very, very targeted, oh no, there we go, a very, very targeted analogous color scheme, which means we hardly see a difference between the center, but we do still see one. If I spread these out a lot, so it'll let me go all the way over to here. This would make no sense, okay? What's the relationship between these colors? Uh, they're all on the color wheel. Okay, that's about it now. It has to be a bit more targeted. I would say don't ever go beyond half of the color spectrum if you're gonna try to make an analogous, but more like don't go beyond the next secondary color. So here we've got yellow, am I on yellow? Yellow, green, and orange. And then these are something in the middle there. Uh, if I move these other ones, right, you can see the whole thing fans out. But I do have control over how bright or dark each one of them is. And the spread, I can't really change them individually. I bet you there's a, a mouse button I could hold. But we generally just don't want to. We could just tune them down here. So if I do that, if I slide them up and down, we start to get variations in these colors, which are a little bit more satisfying. And then I can go further by dragging the darkness sliders up or down. And then we can see we've got, you know, a very interesting kind of color scheme here. I still think this green probably stands out a bit too much, so desaturate that just a little bit. Okay. So there's an example of an analogous color scheme. Okay. And now if I slide this around, all those relationships remain pretty stable, but we get to see other variations. Uh, you can see D and B are very hard to tell apart, but D has a rosier tint and B has a more sallow tint, as in more yellow. Um, but there is a difference. So once you know that that's what the relationship is. Okay. Let's try monochromatic by comparison. Okay, Monochromatic, when I move this around, they're all going to point in the same direction no matter what I do. And the only difference is how they spread along the brightness and saturation. So if I pick this blue, for instance, you can see all of these are different intensities of color and different lightness and darkness, but they're all the same hue, right? I'm not even sure if it'll let me do this, but if I slide this down here, yeah, it slides them all. It doesn't want to let me uh, change that. We'd have to go to custom for that, okay? Uh, monochromatic color schemes tend to be boring. 
they tend to not draw attention to themselves, but they're really well suited to backgrounds and unimportant details that need to be in the scene. Um, they also, in certain uh, ways, tend to look like they are foggy or viewed from far away because one of the um, perspective tools that you can use when you paint is atmospheric perspective. So if you see many shades of blue, then probably the thing is far away and you're seeing it through the sky. Okay. Let's see, triad I think is more complex, but complementary is nice and straightforward right across. So we've got red and green, purple and greenish or yellowish, blue and yellow, orange, cyan and orange, right, going all the way around. And wherever we stop, we're going to get them directly across. You can see how this one is grouped three colors on one side, two on the other. Um, that's fine, but it can be any sort of numbering that you want. In fact, it probably let me drag across. Oh, nope, nope, no, it won't. Oh, well. And then we can mess with saturation and brightness if we want to, but we don't have to. Okay, These tend to be pretty intense as you can tell, but we can tone that down by changing the amount of saturation. Okay. Split complementary, so one side. This one should probably be our primary one, so let's do a yellow on this side. The other side is bluish and purplish, but I think, yeah, it'll let me fan them out and squeeze them together. So at this point, it's almost exactly complementary, but not quite. At this point, it's turning into a triadic. Now it's a triad. Okay, and if we go farther than that, we've gone back into analogous. We just have a, a very simplistic analogous. So keep it somewhere in this region, right? And then we can tune our various colors. Double split. Too complex for my taste most of the time, but you get the idea. Okay, square. I have no idea. Let's see what's square. Everything is at right angles, so four equally spaced colors. Not sure why you'd want that. I think it's getting a little bit too complicated at this point, but I guess you could. Um, triad, we would mentioned before. Okay, like this. What's compound? I'm not sure what compound is supposed to be. Looks like they're all leaning on one side with like a almost complementary color, but not quite. And I don't seem to be able to make the spread thinner, so fine. Shades, this is just monochromatic, except now you also can't change how saturated things are to be different. So I don't know why you would want that button, but it just simplifies monochromatic. And then custom, put them wherever you want. Put them wherever you want. And it'll probably look awful <laughs> if you just put them wherever you want, but why not? Let's uh, turn up the saturation there might not look awful. Some people have a pretty good idea about color just kind of intuitively. Like here I've almost inadvertently created like a cross complementary um, color scheme where we've got centered around orangish yellow and centered around blue because this one's so dark it's not sticking out. So you might be able to get something pretty good. In fact this one doesn't look terrible but it's a little bit awkward. So feel free to use this tool to play around or even to do your homework to help you explore potential color relationships. But let me go to the next one because I like this one even more for brainstorming. Uh, so this one, coolers, right? You just hit generate. And it will give me, yeah, that's fine. It will give me a random color scheme here. And I believe it's spacebar. Yeah, spacebar will generate another random color scheme. And these are all kind of established color schemes that follow some sort of rule set. But the cool thing about this is that if I randomly pop through a little bit and say, I like this color, I can lock it. And now I can hit spacebar and it will regenerate the other four colors instead of that one. And it will try to fit it into some scheme. So this probably has some purple in it. Let's see. No, I don't want to copy that because I want to see what's the color. Okay, I don't know what we're doing here. I thought they would show me sliders. Maybe it's up here somewhere. Anyway, so this one probably has some purple in it because we're generating some purples. Then we've got some peach and some yellow. So this is a complementary color scheme that we've got here. Um, we've got some greens. Or wait, 
this is a complementary color scheme because this is the only purple this is all green I don't know the other one is cross complementary or something some purple some blue some green some yellow a little bit of what almost could be considered red here but you'll see most of them will work somehow okay and now if you're a little bit more specific so let's go until I find another color I like uh, if you lock black or white it's not going to change anything but let's lock um, let's lock this one over here because it's interesting you can also slide them so we'll put these two right next to each other and now when we generate we're gonna get a narrower a narrower um, assortment of additional colors most of them will be shades of these two or something nearly black or nearly white okay. so this can be a kind of cool way to explore a bit and see what your options might be like I hate this one but I wouldn't have thought it myself and maybe it's perfect for some application okay. don't mind the names down here the names are kind of hilarious if you want to read them out but uh, you don't need to worry about that a um, little bit of common stuff is that uh, black and white and gray go with everything so don't worry about including those you can always include those but if you'd like to include something that takes the place of black but isn't quite this right here what they're calling bister bistrate I, I have no idea looks to me like it's a very dark red purple okay this could take the place of black in a color scheme but it's not really black so it's a little bit more complicated so if we lock that one keep shuffling see if we get something nearly white magic mint ooh. <laughs> so this could take the place of white even though it's pretty far off of white and I don't know why they think this purple fits in here I really don't feel it does but either way, there we go like arrow blue this is almost white but still got quite a lot of saturation in it light cyan same sort of thing okay so you can unlock these and reshuffle or you can you know at any point start locking them down uh, if you hover between the two you can add more colors I think there's a way to delete colors yeah right here so if you want to do a color scheme with just three then we can do that and if you want to add more four five six seven Eight. I don't know what the limit is but it'll give you a wider range of colors at some point though you're just gonna get a lot of shades okay all right any questions about those tools or our basic information about color either Elias is asking me a question in chat or he's just typing something the site looks like a cheat sheet sure yeah I mean these are all auto generated so they're not going to be purpose built for your situation but they're a really good place to start oftentimes and if you're just kind of at a loss and you have like a particular color that you know that you want like this one over here lock it shuffle see what else this algorithm can say goes with that and I think there's more options here that I haven't really explored like setting certain schemes or something but I think maybe settings I could change it to secondary info HSB so to set this to like the HSB sliders now you could actually enter this as a formula 345 in hue 80 saturation 67 brightness let's see if that works so oh, I didn't memorize it hang on there it is Okay, so let's get my color picker. All right, so they're saying here, 345, 80, and 67. Yeah, that looks about right. Okay, or you can always just take a screenshot of this and then color pick the right colors if you wanted to do it quickly. Yeah, it is fun. All right, then. Let's look at your assignment. <clears throat> so your assignment is going to be to use the provided sheet in Google Drive, and I'm going to show you where that is right now, to create a color scheme and paint the available characters. Okay, I've got an example that is from Control Paint, which is almost the same thing. 
but I'm also going to grab that one and just show you how to set up your file real quick. Your requirements are to paint the characters using only solid colors. Don't shade them, don't give them flannel and you know textured clothing or anything like that. Just solid colors, okay? And I want you to focus on a couple things. Try to keep the characters visibly distinct. There are unit types though that should look like they share some characteristics and we'll look at that. There are a few special units which need to stand out more, but there are types still. So there are like special of a certain category. They should look like they beyond, belong to that category, but they should grab your attention more, which would mean by adding more contrast. Um, and there's two special characters, a mastermind character and a secret agent character. They are essentially the player character is this evil mastermind, kind of like a James Bond movie. And there's a secret agent, and that would be like your primary antagonist. That one should look the most different of all. Okay. And then for setup and instructions, I'm going to go through that right now. So let's take a look. In Google Drive, I've got a resources folder. And the document that I'm talking about is this one, Secret Agent Characters PNG. So here, we've got concept art from the original game, some really early stuff, and some fully rendered concepts as well as paintings. So you can kind of get the idea, but it belongs to a sort of James Bond-esque um, secret agent world, okay? The characters here, starting up at the top, this guy right here, the basic construction unit would be your smallest, weakest uh, unit, that there's a lot of them and they die a lot. Uh, your military units, right, are tougher. This is a basic one. And this guy is a special military unit. So they should look like they're of a kind, but this guy should grab our attention more. Okay. Down here, there are social units. Just think of them like hotel valets or bellhops. Um, there are scientists. Here's a special scientist and a plain scientist. There are unique villain henchman characters. You can see a couple of them in the painting here. These two are more unique henchmen, as well as I think this guy is too. A unique henchman. That's our secret agent guy. Don't follow the colors on this on these paintings though. Just figure out your own. And then at the very bottom we've got this classic Blowfield um, Bond villain looking guy and then like a James Bond character which would be our adversary. Okay. For an example of the kind of situations they might be in, you can see these rooms. We've got scientific death ray things, tools of sharks, cartoonish traps, and you know television monitors and screens and stuff okay so this is the set of characters that we're looking to create a color scheme for the way you're going to do that is just by coloring underneath the pencil lines for each of these and just leaving them right in place so that we can see your chosen color schemes okay any questions about the assignment before i start demonstrating good all right Good. In one of the articles, um, it leads to uh, control paint. And here we've got a gorilla that was provided by um, that site. Let me turn on all the layers really quick. That looks like this. And you can see down in my layers that there are many, many different layers because they set this up to be convenient for figuring out different uh, color schemes. But let's turn them all off so I can go through them one by one and show you what's going on. These three on the top are special. This one's just the lines all by itself on a layer. Then we've got the fur, skin, armor, armor, accents, and more accents. So each one of those is on its own layer so that I could quickly, if I wanted to, I've got red selected right now, just color over everything and everything on that layer would turn the color that I've got picked. I could even select all by doing control A go to a layer and then I believe it's uh, alt backspace yeah alt backspace to fill with my foreground color in Photoshop so I could say you know what that armor is nice but I'd like some red armor so I'll select that one make it all red and then for armor 2 we'll choose a lighter let's go purpler variant and now he's got reddish armor okay how to set that up is what I'm going to show you guys in a second. In addition to that, he's got some shadows and some highlights. 
and those are layers that have a special blending mode so we've got linear dodge on this one which is going to combine with any colors underneath so here you can see that my purple and reddish are combining to create variants of those colors because of linear dodge and shadow same sort of thing I think this is a slightly bluish shadow but everywhere that I've got colors that I picked we're getting a variant of that color if that was not enabled this is what we get so I'm going to turn it to normal and 100% opacity and you can see how awful that looks okay wow he didn't even pick um, white colors for his highlight so he just knew what he was doing um, even if I turn the opacity down on the shadow layer without using a blending mode it looks pretty bad even if I re recreated this shadow color like let's choose a very dark color so at least it feels appropriate there we go there's the shadows if I turn this down it's gonna kinda work but not as good as if we used multiply or color burn or something okay so to be clear for your homework I don't want you to do this but I'm just showing how it works So turn them all back on to their right settings and they end up looking a lot nicer okay. all right these layers are all separated for convenience okay you can see that there's filled color in just the areas with fur or just the areas with skin but for the sake of simplicity we can just use a single layer and that's what I'm going to demonstrate with I've got one unlocked layer down here that I'm just going to use to color on a certain area of the body and then I'm going to lock it so that I can't paint outside of the bounds of what I've already filled in okay so let me let me show you how to set this up first in fact because I think it would be better I'm going to open up the homework so what was it called secret agent secret agent characters there we go I'm going to set it up in here so when you first open up the homework file it will look like this um, if you're in Photoshop it'll probably be in a locked layer the first thing for you to do is unlock this so if you double click and say OK then it will unlock that layer so that we can do things to it like put layers underneath it we need a new layer and this new layer needs to be beneath it so that we can paint while superimposing this um, this pencil on top of that I'm gonna use a bright color so that I can see if it works underneath and you'll notice nothing is happening because I need to change the blending mode for this upper layer the instructions are in the homework but if I change it to multiply that's going to be the right one okay so multiply means take anything that is darker than what's beneath it and superimpose it on top and in this case we've only got black and white so black is always going to be darker and it's going to superimpose on top so that means that underneath here I can pick whatever colors I want as long as they're not black and then if they're black they'll be invisible but that'll be fine so I can paint this guy orange I can paint these scientists I don't know grayish purple just like that and basically do whatever I want and not be worried that I'm gonna mess up the pencil layer if you're very paranoid about accidentally messing up the pencil layer once you've got it freed up so that you can put things in different places just lock it entirely just hit this lock lock all and now you can't move it you can't scale it you can't paint on it accidentally so if I try to I've got the wrong layer select I'm going to try to paint it tells me nope could not use the brush tool because the layer is locked okay so I move down here now I can paint some more okay it's important to note though even though it looks like we've got a white background right now we don't have any background and we could add one so something I often like to do is I'll make a second layer and I like to fill my composition with gray okay and I'll just go ahead and lock that one as well so now I'm painting on this central layer above gray and below pencils I like to do that just because it gives me less of a initial contrast and so if I want these guys to stand out now I can pick something much much brighter Ooh, sorry that was a paint bucket much much brighter to contrast with the gray I can also now use eraser tool to chisel out the shapes instead of picking like white and painting that in okay so that'll allow me to have transparent and opaque pixels which will help in the next step 
if you are just picking gray over and over, like let's just paintbrush, pick gray and paint and pick purple and paint, pick gray and paint. If you're doing this, when I lock the pixels on this layer, I'm going to have an unpleasant surprise. See that? Because that's what's actually going on. I was painting gray to chisel out those shapes instead of erase. So be sure you're erasing when you're initially shaping these things. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time like that. So here, I'll unlock that, use the eraser tool, get rid of that like this. Then I could relock it and I could paint with whatever color I want and it won't go outside the bounds anymore. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Let me show you setting up one of these characters because you're going to need to do it for as many characters as we've got on the screen. I'm not going to be very picky about uh, sloppy silhouettes on these characters, but try to do a nice job. Okay, there's no reason why you shouldn't get practice doing this, but if you're struggling a little bit and freaking out, oh no, my homework's going to get no points because I'm not outlining this character properly, chill. I'm not grading on that. We're, we're grading on the color scheme. Okay, So something I often do, I'll just grab any old bright color that I can see easily, go over to a character that I'm going to trace out, and just kind of initially block the whole thing in real sloppy. Because there's half the job done. <laughs> okay, there we go. So initially, just fill in everything. I don't want to accidentally miss something in here and have like a little hole in my character somewhere. So just fill it all in. Now I've got the choice of using um, selection tools or erasers or even masking to chisel out this character. Let's do the simple thing and just use an eraser. So now I'm going to go through and you can kind of see my eraser is like semi-transparent because it was intended for painting. That's probably a bad idea. So I'm going to undo a little bit and go up and pick a hard eraser, right? This one. This hard eraser is either on or off, right? I've got control over size because of pen pressure, but either it's removing something or it isn't. So now I can go through and chisel out, whoa, chisel out these shapes. I got to change my cursor back to the more precise one. And it's okay if I go outside the bounds just a little bit like that as long as the edge looks pretty good. Remember to zoom in. Okay? Shrink your tool where appropriate. And then if you do a little bit too much like this, you can always switch back and forth between that and let's do a let's do an inking brush. I think I had a softer brush before. So we can always switch back and forth. And if you can't tell what's what, just pick something and determine that that's the correct choice. So I'll just go through and remove all the parts that I think need to be. My tool's still a little bit big. Shrink that a little bit. Okay. Maybe fill in parts that you missed a little bit. Okay, kind of like that. So there's one option. We can go all the way around the character chiseling like that. Another option. Instead, we could be using one of these selection tools. Um, let me encourage you away from the magnetic lasso tool just for now. It's a great tool. Learn how to use it in your own time. But let's use the ones that you actually control first because lasso tool itself is great for painting. And polygon lasso tool is great for precision, especially designed precision. So the difference between the two is lasso tool is just draw a shape and now you can either delete it or paint inside of it depending on the tool that you've got selected. So that's a pretty cool one. Okay, uh, The polygonal lasso tool requires that you click and then click again and click again and click again. And if you end up double clicking or if you click on the first point, it will finish that shape and now you can paint inside of that or delete it or whatever. So I'll show you polygon lasso tool first. I like to start away from the figure, click on a corner, and then if you've got slight curves, just click a few times, being careful not to double click. So once I've traced out the edge like that, I want to encircle the parts I want to get rid of, finish it, hit delete. Then to start a new one, just click anywhere. 
and start a new shape. So you can see this one's most useful if you've got a lot of straight edges. Okay, but you can get semi curves with it as long as you click often enough to kind of fool the eye like that, you can end up getting what looks like a curve. So if I fill that one in, curved enough. Okay, so that's the polygon lasso tool. Let's do the lasso tool. Click and hold, lasso tool. So for the lasso tool, again, I'm going to start away from the body, like over here, but then I'm going to carefully trace out, I'm holding down my mouse the whole time, carefully trace out, and then I start hitting buttons over here, I'm just going to slice through them. And then when I let go, it will complete the shape, and I can delete. So the lasso tool is more helpful for curving shapes than small little intricate shapes like that. Also notice as I'm doing this with both these selection tools, I'm not trying to do the entire guy all at once. That is torture. Don't try to do an entire figure. Do it in small little chunks like how I'm demonstrating. Okay, one little bit at a time. Because if you mess it all, let's say you go really, really carefully, trace out this foot, and then you go between here because, haha, you're not going to fool me. I'm going to get between these feet. And then I go over here and I go, oh, crap. And then I let go of the mouse and go, oh, oh crap. How do I fix this? Well, the real fix is don't work on too much at once. Just do a small section. That way, if you mess up, it's just like, oh, darn, let me try again. There, okay? You don't have to be any more careful than I'm being right now. This is enough to get color on the right places so that we can clearly see how the character is supposed to be costumed, right? The only thing, eh, probably cut this out. There we go, see how quick that was? Nice and simple. With the brush tool or the eraser tool, that would have taken quite a long time. With this lasso tool, I just roughly trace it out. Okay, and delete. All right. There are more precise tools than this one that I'm showing. We don't need them for this. Okay, And in general, we don't really need them for most concept art. But if you want to learn about them or you already know how to use them and are comfortable, feel free. The goal is to color these guys. But if you don't know these techniques, then your goal is to learn these techniques also. Nice and quick. Don't want to waste a whole lot of time doing that. So there we go. Whole guy's cut out. Any questions about those tools that I just used? Great. Let's do the next part. Assuming that we did a good job and we like it, we've got a character fully filled in with some color, right? I'm going to lock the transparency on this layer. Okay, so that would be by clicking this button right here and we get this little white padlock. So now that means I can paint anywhere that there's already pixels. And my brush will never go outside of that area. So it makes it very, very fast to just play around with colors or even to shade something. This is oftentimes used for shading something also. Okay. So let's try for a little quick color scheme on this villain. All right. Uh, what does he look like to you guys? What's his personality? Is he Santa Claus, serial killer, magic man, devil lawyer? Some warlocky stuff. The voodoo man. Idris Elba from Cats. Sorry, what? <laughs> Idris Elba from Cats. Okay. <laughs> Um, what colors would you like for a voodoo man? And let's let's actually use our tools since we've still got that stuff open. What colors should we use for a voodoo man? He's got this big Crimson coat. Red. Crimson red, ooh. I like that. Can I can I set this custom? Maybe not. Let's let's wait till we see when we get a good red. Um that's close. We're we gonna get a good crimson red. I wish I knew how to view shades. Ooh. There we go. Crimson red. Cool. So we'll make his coat like that because taking a look at him, 
he's got this big jacket, right? Very little skin showing, although he does have bare feet or maybe socks. We can see his slacks. Then there's these little details like buttons and stuff in his hair, maybe a secondary color on his jacket. His hat could be different. We could have his eyes glowing if we wanted to. But there's these little, little details and then this big, big jacket. So crimson red jacket, we'll go for. Okay. Uh, so I've locked that one. And now let me just tap and think about how helpful would these colors be? Could we have, which one? Yeah, I was thinking like skin tone or hair color or something, because I think he's a black man, but this is really dark, right? Let's drag it nearby. So the, the question here is, how is this color going to look right against that red? Because we can see mostly jacket and skin, right? Jacket and skin might be right next to it. I'm just guessing that he has no shirt on, although he does seem to have a collar or something, but he's got no shoes. Maybe there's a vest under there. Who knows? So I want to know how do those things look right up against each other because that's mostly what I'm going to be concerned with. There's no real trouble seeing the difference between these, but I feel like this one or this one might need to be lighter or darker. So let's see with shades. See, if I go lighter, it turns purple, and I kind of want it to be gray, right, and maybe brownish instead if I was going to pick skin tone. But with this particular tool, I don't get like super, oh wait, can I, oh, okay, you can type in a hex code. I don't know how to do that. Uh, HSB, ah, here we go, okay. So it's in the purple spectrum. I'm gonna scoot it back towards red and then reduce, increase the brightness just a little bit and decrease the saturation. Something like that now feels like it could possibly be skin and it still looks good against this crimson. So let me lock both of them and now let's keep going. Yellow details might make sense. Green details might make sense. Blue possibly. Hmm, don't like that really. Darkish green. This is kind of cool because this makes me feel sickly. This really dark green against the skin and the red. I feel a little, a little uneasy but that could be good because he's a villain, right? He's this bad guy character. So if I had like this green hat and red coat or something, that might work. So we've got all these darkish green along with these two warmer colors. Let's try it. Let's try something like that. So I'm going to screenshot just by hitting print screen, just because this is the easy way to do it. And I'm going to go into Photoshop and paste. And so there it is. Get this big old screenshot in it. I've got two monitors, so it's stretching across both of them. But there's my colors, right? I'll just slide that up here to where I can still see it. Just make sure I've got a place to pick from. And then the layer that I was painting on is still right here. Okay. So paintbrush. I'm going to color pick that red. And first thing, I'm going to fill the whole guy in with that red. Okay, like that. Then I'm going to grab the what I'm thinking of as skin color and paint in his face and hands with that to see how I start to feel about it. Hmm, I'm trying to think, like, should I assume? We'll assume he's got a vest on or something under there. And his feet. My tool's still a little bit big. I could always just color pick the red and fill it back in again. You know what? He might even have like ruffled sleeves. You think those are ruffled sleeves there? I think those are ruffled sleeves. Yeah. So what were my colors that we grabbed? Do I have something that would make a good shirt? Probably this lightest one. Let's try that. Okay. So yeah, I'm now seeing as I zoomed in ruffled sleeves. And Presumably, this whole popped collar is ruffled sleeves and shirt. But you can already kind of see the benefit of having the locked layer in that I don't have to be very, very careful. Okay. That's interesting. 
I could continue this down to see what sort of effect this has. You know, I feel like maybe we got like bare stomach under there or something. I feel like Dr. Fusili and the, the frog princess or whatever. And then we've got pants down there, but I doubt his pants would be the exact same color as his shirt. But for right now, we'll just leave that. So see, we've got something started. Maybe not perfect, but we could start to tweak things. Let's go for that uh, hat color. Just see if this gives me anything. Okay. And you know what? That might make a good pants color. So let's go down here. Probably want like the back of the the coat back here to be red also. But we could choose a variant of that red, like a darker one or something. So I think his pants are really only like here. Okay. And I think his pants go like all the way up to there or something. We might have a different highlight color on the trim of his coat. It's a possibility. Okay, we'll say something like that. So how about that for a start? Not too bad? Too gaudy? No. <laughs> so if you really want to mess around with these colors a lot, you can use different layers as clipping masks to do that. Um, something I don't often bother with because I'd rather just paint over really rapidly. But let's say that we want to have fine control over each aspect so that we can adjust it little by little. Uh, instead of just having this one layer, right? we could have several and we could lock them. So for instance, because it's going to be easy, let me just trace out his hat. I'll trace out his hat in this orange. So once again, I'm going to fill it in real quick and then erase out the parts I don't want. Like this. Okay, so now I've got this hat layer. I'm going to lock that. If you're going to do that, you should probably name them. So, hat. But now if I want to adjust that hat to something slightly different, um, I can paint just huge right over the top of it and not care. So let's try a variant rather than a, a dark, dark, desaturated green like that. Let's change this to something a bit more saturated and slightly lighter like that. And we could figure out and see the difference if we like that. We could try an entirely different color, right? So let's go into like the purple keep it dark because the red there you can go something like all the way over here now he's got like a mad hatter kind of thing we could change it to red just like his coat right we could try a variant red so let's go slightly more yellow and darker and desaturated so an orangish something like that and so it makes it really really quick to play around with the colors and change them at the expense of setting up a new layer okay um, there's even one more trick that I can show you. So that's an entire layer dedicated to some part. Let me turn that off. Here I'll make a layer right above my base layer. Okay, so my base layer is this locked one. For this one, I'm just going to say this is like detail, any kind of detail. And I'm going to paint first, doop, 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 straight over the top of them so you can see that when I right click that layer and do a clipping mask, it ends up constraining itself to the pixels on this lower layer. So we could have all our basic color work done down here. And then our detail layer, we could fill in things like buttons and belt buckles and straps and stuff like that. Things that are too small to dedicate to an entire, uh, an entire layer unto themselves. Like let's choose, actually, you know what? This orange could make good belt buckles and buttons and stuff. So as long as we're crossing into that layer now, then we'll start furnishing details. So we'll say maybe his necklace or something. Kind of like that, or a band on his hat. And since it's a layer unto itself, we can still just erase to get rid of any of that stuff. 
okay? and use whatever colors we want and it will only appear on the character because we've already locked those pixels. Okay? That makes sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. One uh, conceit towards style. I don't want you guys to put shadows and highlights and stuff, but if you really want something to glow, keep it simple, but you can do that. Like, let's take like a lime green and just make his eyes glow as if he's like a zombie man or something. So I'm gonna put one more layer up here, choose a soft brush. Oop, need to get my actual brush. Come on, switch. Oh, I got an eraser brush, my bad. Eraser standard, or airbrush standard. Whoa, that's too big, way too big. So I'm gonna put some little little eyeballs in there and then I think I'll go way brighter and choose a harder brush and put a little bit more. Let's go for focused. Whoop, still too big. I can't see how big my brush is because I changed it to this one. So you can do something like that and then if it is indeed a special layer, you could even put this on top of the line work so that you get a better effect overall. Uh, let's change it to like color dodge. Mm. Screen. Mm, screen's okay. So if we really, really wanted to have one little color call out like that, like I don't know why you would on these characters except for possibly him, but like how this green is glowing in the background or maybe a lit cigarette or something on one of the military guys or a glint on this guy's monocle, that's okay. Don't go crazy with it though. Okay, mostly I just want solid colors for a color scheme. All right. Cool. All right. So that is basically your assignment and how you should go about doing it. Try to get some sort of system in place for yourself for letting us know quickly who is military, who is science, who are these guys, and who's special, especially who's special. Okay. These ones, right? These ones are all special. Yeah. Do we have to paint all of the characters? Yes. On this? All of them. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? So we're going to the base. Oh, the one I did with. Oh, no, I'll just say I'm good. Go ahead, Mike. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just doing the basic colors, right? And um, when you mean by no shading and highlights, we can't add like darker uh, versions of red to represent our shadow? I would like you not to. Because although there's a, a right way to do it, and this is the right way to do it, that they've got in this um, demonstration, it is very likely you guys will do it the wrong way, and I won't be able to tell what colors you picked anymore. Okay. Okay, so for right now, since this is just a call-out sheet to show this is what the, the colors are that I've picked, we don't need to include shading, lighting, or patterns. We just need to make them flat colors. This would also be more helpful if you did hand it to a texture artist or a, a 3D modeler because the lighting is going to be done in engine anyway. All right. Um, is it okay if we export it from the color thing? Because I noticed you were sure. speaking on it, but are we allowed to just export it in general? Yeah, I was just lazy. Uh, okay, gotcha. Export PDF image as codes, <laughs> whatever you want. Does Photoshop not let you color pick out of the window? I don't think so. Let's try. Definitely not like this, but maybe like this. No. Uh, although my Photoshop version is old, so there's always a chance that you can now. All right, thank you, David. Yep. All right, you guys. Any other questions? Basic construction unit and basic social unit should have different color schemes, right? Um, yes, they are, um, let's say, just as important to be able to tell that they are something as these other ones, but they're just a standalone unit. So 
for instance, the uh, these social guys aren't going to do the job that the scientists or the military do. And the basic construction guy, he actually does every job but badly in this game. Okay, so he kind of like builds the secret base, which is what all these you know traps and rooms go into. Um, he can fight a little bit and do a little bit of basic work, but isn't very good at anything. So expect to see lots and lots of them, but you know probably dying. And then the rest of them have a specialty. So if possible, make the military guys seem dangerous, right? Or maybe mean. Um, the social guys should be probably like friendly, kind of like a, like a bellhop or a game show host might be. The scientists, I don't know, drab is probably a good way to go, but there's probably other ways. And then these special ones that have, you know, different designs, they should look like they're more interesting in general, especially the hero and the villain. The villain is the player character, so he should stand out probably. Um, and the hero is the antagonist, so you should probably be able to see them coming somehow if there were, you know, a dozen, two dozen units on the screen. It would be important to be able to see the uh, the hero character because that's the one you're trying to target. Okay. We can look at examples from existing games on uh, Friday if you guys want to. Yep. All right. Any other questions real quick? And then we will look at homework review. All right, you guys. So that'll be it for this.